chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 16. I'm your host, Otis Jire, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Brian Martinez, Dominic Eagle, Kisto Healy, and Seth Paul. Tonight, we'll hear stories of the death of love. Unending love, unnerving love, and unknowing love. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail, so lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. <laughs> the show's about to begin. <laughs> Look at that. Just around the corner and the cold weather is about to be warmed with the joys of love. Yes. Valentine's Day is about love shared and love spurned, and we shall hear about it in the stories ahead. Brian Martinez begins our evening with a light touch of murder to make you feel all goosey on the inside, and happy couples are being found posed in the most peculiar ways after having been killed together. But who's doing it, and why? That's the real mystery here. Without further ado, I present to you, Quiver. They find victims, 23 and 24, on a park bench in Alamo Square. I say they, but really it's just one guy, wearing two coats and a leathery screen. He's freaked out so badly that whatever he's high on isn't enough to numb the shock of what he's seen. Most of the victims are discovered like this by someone who already has a fairly rocky relationship with reality, and this is all the push they need to break up with it for good. By the time I get to the scene, a few curious onlookers are leaning over the yellow tape, as CSI does their paparazzi thing, behind a black nylon privacy barrier. I figure I have less than 20 minutes before the first full van of vultures shows up so I might as well get a good look before they start flapping around and pulling my attention away. The officer, working the crowd, Durant, spots me coming and wrinkles his graying eyebrows. 
Hey, Harper. Honeymoon over yet? That was six years ago. I say, ducking under the tape, you losing track of time out here? You know what I mean. The fights must have started by now. They don't play nice for long once the ring's on the finger. Guys like Durant always want you to admit you're just as unhappy as they are. It makes them feel better about their own choices. Like there's no way someone could actually enjoy their partner's company. It's not them that's flawed, you see. It's the entire institution of marriage. The truth is, Duran, the only thing we fight about is you. I say, and he chuckles. She thinks about me that much? <laughs> Absolutely. She says I should use my sidearm to put sad pricks like you out of their misery. Let me tell you. His scowl alone is worth the price of admission. Leaving Duran to his tourist wrangling, I head toward the benches at the center of the park, where all the action is going down behind the black barrier. The pop flash of a camera momentarily projects a pair of silhouettes onto its nylon screen, a split-second movie of two seated corpses leaning toward each other. You could almost convince yourself they're alive and happy, and whispering sweet nothings to each other in that second. With an exhale of cold, tired breath, I walk around the barrier to get a look at what I already know. The two look to be in their mid-twenties, nicely dressed, with skin and teeth denoting decent hygiene and upper-middle-class means. If I were to guess, just based on his build, I'd say the young man was a personal trainer, or at least spent a decent amount of time in the gym. The young woman has immaculate makeup and hair good enough for a movie set. Also, their hearts have been removed. Like victims 1 through 21, the two bodies have bloody caverns where their hearts used to be. The precision is far from surgical. The organs ripped out whole, same as the previous killings. The wounds would suggest a crime of passion. Like the perpetrator didn't just want to remove their hearts, but needed to. This has been going on every day since the 1st of February. There's always two victims in a location one would consider romantic, missing their hearts. Sometimes they're dating, sometimes they're married, but always they're posed in a kiss, a lean, a lover's embrace. The lab's been trying to figure out what the killer uses to dig the hearts out of their chests. It's like a knife, but the shape's wrong, rougher, and leaves behind traces of lead. On the ground, next to the young couple's feet, both of their phones lay where they've dropped. Hers has a cracked screen from the impact, but his phone's intact. We need to get these unlocked, the CSI agent says, pulling out a handful of evidence bags. One guess what's on them, I reply, looking over at the sun setting behind the iconic Victorian houses of San Francisco, the painted ladies. It's a great view, good enough to take a picture. By the time I get home, Amy's asleep on the couch, and the TV wants to know if she's still watching. She looks so small, curled up there under a fleece blanket, and yet her snoring's loud enough for a dock worker who just polished off a six-pack of beer in a garden of smokes. She's always been a snorer, though it embarrasses her to hear it. It's a good thing I'm such a heavy sleeper or we'd have had separate bedrooms by now. I turn off the TV and wake her softly, taking the blanket off and guiding her from the couch to the bedroom. Her steps are small and shuffling like she's on a chain gang. Oh, sorry I fell asleep. She says, looking up at me with eyes barely open. I've told you so many times not to wait up for me, but you don't listen. I know, she says. It's part of my charm. She gets in bed and I head to the bathroom to wash the day off. In the shower, I scrub hard and don't think about how much force it takes to break through a human chest plate. I also don't think about victims who don't struggle, who remain perfectly still with eyes open as their partners are butchered next to them. It's a good thing, too. I can really mess with the person. When I dry off and get under the covers, I discover Amy's still awake. I also discover she's very much naked. So that's why you waited up, I say, crawling up next to her warmth. 
I'd be lying if I said I hadn't been thinking about it all day. Well, Jacob, it certainly wasn't a sparkling conversation, she replies. And with that smile, it lights me up. 25 and 26 are discovered by a fisherman on Pier 7. But I quickly discover it has one of the best views of the eastern waterfront. I walk the length of the wharf, benches and ornate streetlights on either side all the way to the end. This time, Duran doesn't even look me in the eye. The two victims are two women wearing matching red scarves. Their bodies are huddled in one of the alcoves extending over the rolling ocean, arms entangled and eyes facing each other. The murder scene is beautifully lit by the ring light, mounted on a stand several feet from them. I have to say, it really highlights the congealed blood in their gaping chests. As one of the CSI guys checks the railing for fingerprints he won't find, I get a call from the lab. Good morning, Harper, Miller says. Oh, it's a great one, I reply. What do you got for me? It could be nothing, but I'll let you decide. On a whim, I carbon dated the lead recovered on one of the victims. Keep in mind that radiocarbon dating is typically only for living objects, like bone or wood. However, some lead carbonates contain atmospheric carbon dioxide that can be... Okay, okay, I believe you. I cut him off. Well, you may not believe this. The lead dates back to at least 1100 B.C., I rub my face, trying to make sense of the new information. Aren't most metals old? Not exactly. A weapon manufactured in current times with modern techniques wouldn't give us results like this. This I wasn't expecting. So you're telling me the murder weapon is an ancient artifact? It's hard to say exactly, but it appears so. When I'm done on Pier 7, I ask if the department uh, can call a press conference asking people to stay away from the cynic spots, or at least not to take pictures of them, as it seems to be triggering the attacks. But I'm shot down immediately. The killings have made very few waves in the current news cycle, and the higher-ups very much want to keep it that way. Valentine's Day. I'm sure officers are posted at every romantic photo op I can think of. Foreign cinemas, outdoor patios, Stowe Lake, Maroga Stairs at Grandview Park, Golden Gate Park, Bay Bridge, both botanical gardens, and the list goes on. You name a cute picture, and I request a unit to keep tabs on it. Make the rounds from one site to another, all watching my phone for a call, but I don't get a single damn bite. Not even a false alarm, which should be good news, except it might mean my theory's wrong, and the next killing is happening somewhere else in the city. Somewhere I'm protected. It's an hour to midnight, and I'm feeling like a jackass for coming in on what was supposed to be my day off, ruining a perfectly good chance to spend time with Amy when I think of something I missed. Before I can second-guess myself, I'm jumping into my car and pinning the gas pedal to the floor. On the way, I call for backup, but I'm told there isn't any to spare, not unless I can give them more to go on than a hunch. There's a footpath in the Presidio, less than a mile long. It runs north to south between two parts of Presidio Boulevard. It's called Lover's Lane, and it's so obvious, it makes me want to kick myself in the throat. Instead, I nearly crash into one of two stone pillars marking the entrance to the park. Leaving my car behind to enter the path on foot, it doesn't take long for the tall eucalyptus trees lining the path to swallow me up, their leaves rustling in the night breeze. With my hand close to my sidearm, I walk the path with little to see except dim streetlights every few hundred feet their bulbs struggling against the light fog. My footsteps sound hollow on the stone underfoot, and for a while they're the only thing I hear until about ten minutes in, when my ears perk up an odd mumbling sound in the shadows ahead. A shape becomes visible up the path, and I slow my footsteps. As I draw closer, I find it's a man wearing a long coat and a pouch on his back. 
He's down on his knees, hunched over what appears to be a burlap bag, laid at the center of the path. The man's old and uh, emaciated. I want to dismiss him as homeless, tragic, yes, but a distraction from my business at Lover's Lane. You should move along, sir, I call out. Although a lone man wouldn't be a target, he could still put himself in danger by witnessing something he shouldn't. But as I approach him, I get a glimpse of what's inside the open bag. I pull my weapon and shout at him to get down on the ground, but he doesn't look up from the collection of hearts beneath him. He continues to look down at them, one of the hearts inside still steaming in the frigid air, as he says the words that will chill me to my marrow. You love your wife, Jacob. I have no business with you. He catches me off guard. He doesn't call me Detective Harper, like he knows me from work, or even Jake, like a friend might, but Jacob. Only Amy and my mother have ever called me Jacob, and even the tone he uses reminds me of the way Amy says it. I need you to slowly turn toward me, I say, trying to maintain control of the uneasy situation. Slowly? His face wrinkles up into a smile, like a dance. He rises easily for a man of his age, his movements strangely graceful. With my weapon trained on him, I take a few steps toward to get a better look. His features have a childlike quality, but the skin's dry and loose like it gave up years ago. He was handsome once, I can see, but now his eyes are jaundiced and his teeth rotten. Even his clothes have seen better days, though I can't tell you what decade those days fell in. Step away from the bag and put your hands in your head, I order. He listens, swaying as if moving across the dance floor. You always prefer to lead, don't you, he asks. Shut up, now turn around. His amused smile tightens. I like this game, Jacob, but I can't play for much longer. I'm afraid I still have much work to do. I said turn around. His eyes burn into me, but he listens. As fast as I can, I holster my weapon and handcuff his hands behind his back. Noticing his back is large and bulky, the coat possibly hiding a hunch. I also can't help but notice overlapping scars and burn marks all over his hands and his wrists, like he spends his time sifting through campfires. It's a strange sight, but the questions will have to wait until later. I slip the long leather pouch off him and throw it into the grass, the sound of jostling metal inside telling me I've found my murder weapon. You have the right to remain silent. I start, but he cuts me off. I refuse to be silent. Silence is what allowed this world to die and fester and rot. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. I continue. Given the nature of his crimes, I expected the case to end in the discovery of some monster, if I found him at all. But his rhetoric is one I've heard a thousand times before. You have the right to an attorney, if you can't afford an attorney. One will be appointed for you. Do you understand the rights I've read to you? He's quiet for a moment, looking up into the trees. He looks almost like a typical old man, the kind who spent years in the streets or in some other filthy place. I sneak a look at the burlap bag bulging with human hearts to remind myself just what I'm dealing with. You're truly a hero, Jacob, he says. It's no wonder Amy thinks so highly of you. His words leave me feeling like I've been punched in the chest. What'd you just say? He glances at me over his shoulder. He's had many romantic offers, you know, from men younger and wealthier than you, but she remains so loyal to you. That's a rare thing, one that shouldn't be taken lightly. Do I know you? I ask. Hearing Amy's name and his killer's lips wasn't something I was prepared for. But now that it's done, I need answers. Of course not, he scoffs. Most people know of me, but no one actually knows me. Not for a long time now. The shock of what he said boils down for me to a red rage. I tempted it to pull my weapon again. Instead, I spin him around and grab him by the stinking collar. 
Quit it with the vague answers, I growl. How do you know my wife's name? Have you been following me? He smiles impatiently, the smell of his blackened teeth, invading my nose. I told you I have no business with you, Jacob, and I never lie. My patience is running thin for your game. Yeah? Well, the games are just starting. I push him to the ground where he lands hard on his side. My anger has gotten the better of me. A fall like that should break a few bones on a man his age, but he doesn't even seem to feel it. In fact, he begins to chuckle. That's enough for me. I take out my phone to call it in, something I should have done a while ago, before I become distracted by his words, but I find it isn't working. Not just the service. The phone itself won't even turn on. I smack it against my palm, hoping to see the screen blink. Problems? He asks from the ground, then laughs even harder. I feel like giving him a kick in the ribs to see if his bones do in fact break. But just then, I spot the movement of two young men walking side by side up the path. Excuse me, I call out. Please, stop right there. I need to use one of your phones. The two don't even react. It's as if I didn't even speak. Excuse me, hello? I take a step toward them, thinking maybe they're hard of hearing. But even directly in their eye line, I don't exist to them. They continue walking and talking as they pass me right by. They don't see you, Jacob. The old man calls to me. Not because they can't, because they don't care. None of them care anymore. They're a thousand miles apart, even when they sit right next to one another. I shout one more time at the pair, nearly screaming now. But they walk around the bend and out of sight, leaving me alone again with the old man. Worse, when I turn back to look at him, I notice a pair of handcuffs lying on the ground a few feet from where he sits, and still behind his back. My handcuffs. Let me see those hands, I say, pulling my gun. But you've already seen their work, and that's the same, don't you think? Oh, not just these past few weeks. You've seen what I do your whole life. He shrugs. Still, if it gives you pleasure to look. The old man stands, his hands free, as I shout and spit and threaten. He takes a few steps toward the leather pouch, locking eyes with me as he picks it up. If you don't put that down, I'll be forced to fire on you. I warn, gripping my gun tighter. Don't pretend like you don't want to, he says with a grin. Then he reaches into the long pouch, no matter how much I yell at him to stop, and pulls out two objects from inside. They're arrows, one gold at its head, and the other something duller, a metal I'm willing to bet is lead. He grips them under the head like knives, and I can just imagine him stabbing and shoveling his way into someone's chest. You know the story of this path we stand on, you and I? He asks. I'm not here for a history lesson. Now put down the weapons and get those hands back up, I reply. But he continues, undeterred. It was cut from the earth in the 18th century as a shortcut for Spanish soldiers and missionaries to walk to Mission Dolores, just south of here. But the name, Lover's Lane. Soldiers used it to reach their wives, I say trying to get his speech over with, and his wrinkled face lights up. So you do know. You see, that's love. That's devotion. A simple walk on a hot summer's day. Not like these people now. They make me vomit with their signaling and posturing, caring more for their outward image than their lover by the side. They don't want to be happy, you understand. They want to be seen as happy. The way he talks, the way he looks into my eyes, I can't look away. I'm trying to stay aware of my surroundings, but it's like my vision is a pinhole camera that sees nothing but him. I love this city, don't you? What am I saying? Of course you do. You pretend it's the same as everywhere else, but you protect it like it's your child. He takes a step forward. I've always liked you, Jacob. You would kill your neighbors sooner than leave your wife. That's as it should be. That's true worship. Not these candies and greeting cards. As he talks, he continues to move toward me. 
I try to tell him to stop where he is, but my lips feel glued shut, my tongue paralyzed. He takes another step, rubbing the arrowheads with his dry fingers, and I know the only chance I have is to drop him where he stands, but my finger won't squeeze the trigger. My hands tremble as I put all my strength into them, fighting whatever's keeping them from working, begging them to move, to pull the trigger, but nothing happens. In a moment, the old man reaches me. He looks back and forth between the two arrows, gold and lead, then at me. His smile is warm and friendly as he brings the lead arrow up, holding it above his head, and then swings down and buries it in my chest. A cold fire grips my heart, spreading out through my body. My veins are like frozen rivers, limbs numb dead. I expect my legs to give out, to collapse under me, but somehow I remain standing, staring into the old man's eyes as he pulls the arrowhead from my chest. The pain is so great I can move for a moment, gripping him by the side to steady myself. At my touch, I feel something on his back move under his coat, like he's hiding two more arms back there, and even in my pain and paralysis, I squirm at the feel of it. You should have let me conduct my affairs, the old man says sadly. Now your Amy has to suffer the sting of your distance. The ache of your dulled spark as she looks wantingly into your eyes and feels nothing in return. As for me, there's always next year. I still have much work to do. He lets go of me and I fall. Fall like a dead tree uprooted in a storm. I barely feel the impact of the ground on my back, just the cold that follows, seeping up into me from the frozen ground and me down into it. That and a pulsing wind on my face, like the beating of great wings lifting up, up into the black. The doctors give me blood, but the cold never leaves my heart. Amy comes to see me crying and saying how happy she is that I pulled through, but when I look at her face, I feel nothing. They say I have PTSD and put me on a bunch of pills to do nothing. I come home two weeks later, and Amy's like a stranger in my house, or maybe I'm a stranger in hers. I don't know. All I can do is play the part and hope she doesn't notice. I try crying about it. I try feeling bad about myself. But my eyes stay dry. I'm told a woman out for a jog found me that night, half dead on the ground and mumbling about Spanish missionaries. From the scene, they recover my gun and my phone, both functioning perfectly and nothing else. Eventually, I track down the two young men uh, who walked by us that night, but they say they've never seen me before, and I have no reason not to believe them. February passes, and so do the murders. There's a calendar on my desk that I now use to count down to Valentine's Day. Some people think I'm the romantic type, others that I can't stand an unfinished case, and I let them keep thinking that. The truth is, I'm counting down to a hunt, not just for that old man, but for his quiver. Because if I ever get my hands on it, if I can get hold of one of those golden arrowheads in my own unfeeling fingers... I'm burying that thing right in my own dead hearts. I hope you enjoyed Quiver by Brian Martinez, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author... You can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Brian dash Martinez. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash B R I A N dash M A R T I N E Z. You can also see him at his website at bloodstreamcity.com. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Wow, how hard must it be out there when even the bringer of love has gone sour on the whole thing? Guess if you haven't found anybody yet, don't get your hopes up. We turn to our second story of the evening, 
courtesy of Dominic Eagle. We meet a man who has the perfect life, going on vacation to enjoy time with his wife. But it's possible their getaway won't be the bed of roses it seems to be, because some people just don't want to be alone on certain days. Without further ado, I present to you First Love. Valentine's Day is a time of joy for some and sorrow for others. And naturally, a person's mood on this occasion is tied to their relationship status. Singletons loathe the day, which is understandable. Personally, I'm a married man with two beautiful children. This celebration of love should spark feelings of warmth and wholeness. And yet it does not. A traumatic memory casts a witty shadow over this cursed day. The year was 2021. My wife and I were on our honeymoon in Paris. Croissants again? Jenny laughed as I lovingly carried the breakfast plate into the room. It's France, I said, shrugging. What else are we going to eat? Something else, Ian, she said, giggling. We need to go wild. It's nice to have a break from the kids and eat something other than toast. But I want to be adventurous. What else could we have? Not just croissants every day. Come on. Gotcha, I replied. Pan au chocolat? Jenny snorted, rolling her eyes. Oh, I almost forgot. My wife cried, then slid to the side of the bed before reaching over to grab something. With eyes beaming brilliantly, she hoisted a large gift bag onto the bed. It was decorated with sparkly blue bears against a white background. I couldn't quite put my finger on it at the time, but the present evoked a heavy feeling within me. Something churned and twisted in my stomach. I didn't like the bag at all. Not at all. What have you got there? I teased, awkwardly concealing my discomfort. A present for me? Very coy, she laughed. This was awfully sweet of you, Ian. I raised an eyebrow. Uh, what do you mean, Jenny? My wife snorted. Okay, Ian, we'll play your game. Oh, I wonder what this could be. Let's open it. It'll totally be a surprise for both of us. No, Jenny, I'm being serious. I said as my wife eagerly tore into the bag. Oh, she exclaimed, shaking a box of Cadbury's chocolates in the air. I take back my sassy comment about the croissants. You brought a little bit of home to us. I, uh, I awkwardly trailed off. No, Jenny, I didn't buy you that. Where'd you get that bag? My wife surveyed my face for a few seconds. Then her smile dissipated. We knew each other inside and out. She could tell that I was being serious. After so many years together... We'd become well accustomed to one another's emotions, and my paleness must have spoken for itself. This was no practical joke. But then her smile returned and she shook her head. The hotel, she said laughing. That makes so much more sense. It was sitting outside the door. They know this is the honeymoon suite, so they must have thought to leave a present. That's so kind of them. I frowned. I don't know. This is very odd. I'm not sure that's included in the package, sweetie. And how would they know our favorite chocolate? Cadbury's is everyone's favorite chocolate. Jenny chuckled. They probably just chose the most British thing they could find. Ooh, look at this. My wife produced a purple knitted hat from the bag, eyeing it with a look of sheer glee. This is adorable, she squealed. Perfect for a wintry honeymoon. And look, purple. It matches the Cadbury bar. My stomach grew a little more unsettled. There was something very off-putting about the mystery gift bag. Plenty of hotels leave small gifts for guests. But a chocolate bar and a woolly hat? No, that was extremely odd. And above all else, the alarm bells were ringing with increased ferocity. And that only worsened as Jenny pulled out the next gift from the bag. 
<laughs> Look, honey, my wife laughed, waving the CD around. Your favorite Tame Impala album. Though I don't know anyone who uses CDs anymore. Lonerism, the album of my youth. Grouped with the chocolate and the purple knitwear, it slotted neatly into the jigsaw, which neared completion. The sickness in my gut deepened, and I thought back to 2013. The year that I had pushed to the back of my mind. I was in my final year of college, which is a tumultuous transitional period for any child taking exams, moving to university, leaving friends behind, and relationships. My college sweetheart, Louise. Happy Valentine's Day, she cried, handing the gift bag to me. I remember the two of us hiding in our private spot around the back of the gym, storage containers, our makeout haven, our special place. We'd spend our lunch hours sitting there talking about life, love and everything in between. There's nothing quite like a first love. It molds one's very sense of self. It makes a person, and it breaks a person. What is it, I asked, opening the bag. Louise giggled, just open it, Ian. I obliged. And eight years later, standing in that hotel room with my wife, I finally remembered everything. The Blue Bear gift bag, the Cadbury's chocolate bar, the purple hat, the Tame Impala CD. Jenny, I whispered in a measured tone, let me go to the front desk and ask about the bag. Yeah, this is a slightly bizarre assortment of gifts, my wife finally admitted, tucking into a croissant. Okay, I'll wait here. Bring us up some... Pan of chocolate on your way back. You've made me peckish now. Heart pounding in my chest, I walked down the seemingly endless corridor to the lift. Hurriedly racing to the front desk, I reflected on my youth. I reflected on Valentine's Day 2013. Are you okay? Louise asked. I remember eyeing the gift bag, unintentionally crumpling it in my hands as I absentmindedly averted my girlfriend's gaze. I couldn't find the words to say what I needed to say. The hypothetical conversation that had been playing on my mind for weeks. But I summoned the courage to say the words which had long needed to escape my lips. I think we need to break up, I said. My girlfriend didn't say anything. We sat in silence for a minute. Could have been longer. I don't know. I wanted to say something, but I was giving Louise room to breathe, room to think. And then, eventually, she spoke. Is this about university, she asked. Because we can make it work, Ian. I thought about all of it. Sandy said, I've got the promotion in the bag. I'm going to become general manager, and then I'll be able to afford a flat. And I can pay for it. We'll move in together, you'll go to university, and it'll be like a dream come true, Ian. Louise, I started. You promised, Ian, she screamed viciously. I sat very still, shaking a little. My girlfriend had always had a slight temper, but it's the sort of thing a person overlooks when young and infatuated. Our feelings were too powerful for me to notice the slightly unhinged elements of her personality and I still hadn't noticed them. The anger, the obsessiveness, the recklessness. None of that even factored into my reason for breaking up with her. No, it was just that I was ready to move forward. I wanted to meet people at university, go out, have fun. Louise, on the other hand, just wanted to hole up, hibernate in a sense. She wanted the two of us to get away from everyone and everything, family and friends. It had felt that way for months, and it had frightened me. I started to pull away. My love for her had started to fade. But at the age of 18, being young and foolish, I hadn't even noticed the true warning signs. I'd noticed the symptoms of the disease, but not the horror at the heart of the girl. I know I promised things, Louise, I said, sighing. But we were young. We're still young, Louise screamed. 
I jolted in fear before peering around the side of the gym container. Nobody was in the vicinity, fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how one views the situation. Okay, fine. I admitted before unleashing the truth. We're still young. You're right. And that's why I want to get out there. I want to live a little. You can live with me. Louise stuttered, panting. What makes you think you wouldn't be able to live with me? I scrambled for words, sighing exasperatedly. I, I, well, it's not that, it's just, Louise, I, why don't you say what you really mean, Ian? Louise asked, eyes bearing into my very soul. You want to date around, don't you? You aren't content with one girl, a girl who would give you everything, a roof over your head, food on the table, children. I don't want all of that just yet, I cried. I'm 18, Louise. I want to be free. I want to have fun. I want to mess around. I don't want to think about houses or children. I don't want to be shut away in a house with you. And then there was the painful truth. I could see it cutting through Louise's thick skin. A simple sentence that shattered her heart into pieces. And I could easily paint myself to be a saint in this picture, but the truth couldn't be farther from that fact. I'd toyed with her emotions, led her down the garden path, only to strip the dream away. In the past, I'd gushed about the future with her, promised that we would love each other forever. But I was only a child, and children say things they don't mean, even if they think otherwise. I imagine it must have been an overwhelming pill for Louise to swallow. Heartbreak's a horrible experience, and at the age of 18, hormonal imbalances cause the entire ordeal to be twice as excruciating. However, what made it such a dangerous decision on my part was that I was breaking the heart of a girl not quite like the others. And I do not mean that in an endearing way. Louise's sobbing suddenly ceased, abruptly and unnervingly. She smiled, beaming at me with cold, unfilling eyes. Hollow eyes that I'd never seen before. But I could tell that I was seeing her true self. A version of Louise that had been masked for a long time. Okay, Ian. The girl whispered softly. Have a nice life. The voice was sickly sweet. A pleasantry with a sinister undertone. I could almost feel the barbed thorn lurking beneath the surface of her words. It threatened to break free, but Louise was holding herself back, restraining herself in some primal part of myself. I could feel that. And then, without warning, her nails, like the talons of a wildcat, swooped up and slashed my face. One nail caught my pupil, and I wailed as the razor-like edge tore into my eyeball, partially blinding me for life. Shaking, I clutched my bloody, wounded face. The girl eyed me and I froze in fear. I truly believed that her violent assault would continue, but it did not. My entire body tensed as the girl stood up. I don't know who was standing before me, but it wasn't the Louise I'd known for years. It was someone else, something else. And though I now know I was finally looking at the real Louise, I still hadn't processed that I'd been living in a love-struck bubble for four years. I watched Louise stiffly walk away, a chill tickled the nape of my neck, as did the blood trickling down my cheek. The hell of being in love with someone from the age of 14 to 18. That's an experience I cannot put into words. I'm sure my words ring true for anyone who's felt love at that age. It's a visceral feeling, that person becomes intertwined with you. You're still growing and developing, and when you hurl love into the mix, a deadly concoction's created. And what I had unwittingly created was something beyond poisonous. The life was painfully slow. I watched the numbers scroll past at a snail's pace, and my heartbeat was quickening. It pounded more and more demandingly against my chest, urging me to get to the bottom of this horrifying blast of the past. It isn't her, I tried to convince myself. How could it be her? She doesn't know you're here, Ian. You've not spoken to her in eight years. 
It's not Louise. It just isn't her. But the self-talk did nothing to still my nerves. I knew it was Louise. There was nothing convincing about my insistence to the contrary. Who else would have been able to replicate the exact Valentine's Day gift from eight years prior? I didn't wait for the lift doors to fully part. I slithered between them and half sprinted toward the front desk, shocking a woman waiting by the front desk. She averted her gaze, and I didn't blame her. I had a deranged demeanor. The man at reception also looked unsettled by me. Uh, may I help you, sir? The concierge asked. I scratched my stubble anxiously. I, uh, did you leave a bag by my door? The man frowned. No, monsieur. What kind of bag was it? Oh, it was, it was a gift bag, blue, covered in bears. I said, panting erratically. The concierge shook his head. No, Mr. Smith. All gifts are arranged by me. I was planning something for you and the lovely Mrs. Smith this evening, but not a gift bag. It must be a mix-up involving one of the other guests. The wrong room, perhaps. Would you like me to look into it? There was the answer I'd already suspected. No, I said, sweating. I, uh, I'll head back to the room. I turned around, and that was when I saw something utterly horrifying. The lift doors were open. A woman stood inside. She had lifted her head to finally meet my gaze. I recognized those cold, unfeeling eyes, that twisted, thin-lipped smile. It was Louise. But as I ran towards the lift, the doors closed. Uh, Monsieur? The concierge called. Are you okay? I called the police, I cried. That woman is dangerous. The baffled hotel worker shouted something at me as I darted toward the staircase, but I couldn't hear a thing over the alarm bells in my brain. Adrenaline pumped violently through my veins, and I could feel my heartbeat in my ear canals. As I fumbled for the door handle to the hotel staircase, I realized my vision was swimming. Anxiety was wreaking havoc on my senses. Intrusive thoughts swam through my brain as I tried to imagine the nightmare that Louise was about to unleash, but even my darkest imagination could not have compared to what I would find. I stumbled through the doorway that led to the second floor, and I frantically raced down the corridor. Room 215. No, 216. 216, I repeated it to myself, finding that I could scarcely think properly. And when I reached the door to our hotel room, it was sitting ajar. Louise! I cried, barging inside. The room was dark, the curtains had been drawn, and I could hear a strange sound, a horrible sound. Sobbing, but muffled sobbing. In here, darling, a voice cooed. It was not Jenny. My legs had become rickety and untrustworthy. I found myself back in my 18-year-old body, back on that terrifying day behind the gym container as I clutched my savage face in fear. I felt a throbbing sensation in my eye, the eye that had never been the same since that fateful day, and when I gingerly rounded the corner, I screamed in horror. Even with blurry eyesight in a dingy, unlit room, I could see enough. Jenny was tied to a chair and her mouth was hanging open. It was overflowing with blood. She screamed something unintelligible at me, and a voice giggled in an unhinged tone. I stumbled backwards, suddenly noticing the lady in the corner of the room a shadowy, indistinguishable figure that I knew to be Louise. The demented woman slowly strolled forward and hurled something on the floor before me. Carpet illuminated by light from the corridor, I realized what was lying at my feet. A severed tongue. I emptied the contents of my stomach on the floor, and Louise cackled. Hello, sweetie, she whispered. I've missed you so much. Jenny cried and tried to say something, but her words were garbled nonsense. Hush, honey, we're talking, Louise said, tutting. What is this? I cried, standing up. What are you doing here? It's been eight years to the day. Louise icily interrupted. But I never stopped loving you, darling. I just waited patiently for the day you'd be ready. Ready, I asked. What are you ready to have a life with me in? She whispered, 
giggling, ready to have a family. As she neared me, the light from the corridor illuminated her deranged, demonic face, and I hardly had a moment to process the ghoulish glint in her eye. She had already pounced at me. The two of us fell to the floor, and I found myself, yet again, apprehended by the woman's surprising strength. You settled down with her, Ian. You have a house, children, a quiet life. But you didn't want any of that with me, Louise hissed crazily. Possessed by strength I didn't know I had, I launched the terrifying woman to my right. Her back collided with an upright mirror, shattering the glass into thousands of pieces, and the lady lay sobbing on the floor. I kept a piece of you with me, she wailed, as I rushed over to Louise. You've always been with me. Look, as I hastily untied Jenny, I found my eyes wandering to Louise's waving arm. She was cradling something in her hand the locket which hung around her neck. A fingernail was attached to the end of it. It was rotten and revolting. It's still in there, Ian, she whispered, crying. Under the nail, just as I'm still in there. She pointed at my face. Under your skin, she groaned. Riddled with fear and disgust, I kept my eyes on the thick, well-knotted ropes that were binding Jenny to the chair. I didn't respond to the unwell woman. Eventually, untying her, I wrapped my wife's arm around my neck. We walked past Louise's injured, writhing body. But as we were a foot from the open door, I suddenly felt unnaturally strong fingers coil around my ankle. Look at me! Louise cried in an inhuman shriek. Run! I barked at my wife. But Jenny didn't listen. Bloody mouth, she stamped furiously on the unyielding hand of my sick college sweetheart. The sick woman howled in agony, releasing my ankle. And then Jenny, driven by some primal fury, unleashed a war cry before driving the sole of her foot squarely into Louise's shocked face. My terrifying ex-girlfriend's neck snapped backwards and she crumpled like a rag doll. Jenny, bloody mouth and trembling, fell onto me, and I supported her arm around my neck again. I half expected Louise to have fled by the time the concierge and the police arrived in our room, but they found her in the lightless coroner. She was rocking on her haunches and mumbling something either unintelligible or lost in translation. Louise has been in prison for the last three years, but that doesn't make me feel safe. I dread Valentine's Day, as does Jenny. And we certainly don't buy surprise gifts for each other. I hope you enjoyed First Love by Dominic Eagle, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale... And we'd love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author. You can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Dominic Dash Eagle. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash D O M I N I C dash E A G L E. You may also be interested to know. He's expanded into new ventures with his YouTube channel, Black Volumes. Look for it if you're brave enough. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's very talented feature author. And more than that, a thank you to all of tonight's featured authors. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me tonight for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror... Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. 
You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. If you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.